privilege to introduce Pastor Bill Hickson, who's been the pastor at Athens Bible Church for 47 years. Is that it? Yep. <laughs> Going on 50. And uh, he he's had his MD, uh, Master of Divinity degree at Grace Bible uh, Seminary back in the early 70s when it was really strong with Dr. Hoyt, Dr. Whitcomb, Dr. Boyer, Pastor French. <laughs> So, and my wife and I had the privilege of sitting under his ministry there in Athens, a true shepherd and a great teacher, and uh, have continued to enjoy uh, really his shepherding ministry and counsel. So we thank God for Pastor Hickson, his faithfulness. They have things going on, a building program, very good architect with a design, and and hopefully a a builder who will come through uh, this spring for them. And one of their prayer requests is a young man to come alongside. (laughs) So it's a mystery what he's preaching on, though, because we didn't get the info. So, But the Bible talks about we're stewards of the mysteries of God. So we'll see whatever it is he's going to bring. I'm sure it'll be a blessing. Thank you, Pastor Doug. It's a delight to be here. I always enjoy uh, being at Salem Bible Church and always enjoy being at this conference. 
uh, and we appreciate Doug's help in that building program. He's been a huge help to us with his knowledge, uh, and we just are so very thankful. M many good memories of having him, he and uh, Valerie, in our church. It's a joy to be here with uh, all the other speakers. Uh, Pastor Matt and I have spoken at conferences many different times. Sometimes I'm the main speaker and he's the secondary. I, I, sometimes he's the main speaker and I'm the secondary. The secondary fellow has a distinct role, in my opinion. Um, no matter how good the speaker is, that speaker needs relief. You, you just get tired. And, and the congregation needs relief <laughs> just to hear somebody else. And different people give it different ways. If you've ever heard Myron Houghton, his humor was a relief, even if everybody else was good, or Bob Philbrick, or Les Olala. And those guys were incredible with uh, uh, with relief. Well, I'm not them. <laughs> I don't I don't have their humor bone. I wish I did. I envy them with that. But uh, uh, but that's my role. I don't know what to call it. It's not really a relief pitcher. That's doing real good. <laughs> but um, it's not roll aids either. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, you've got me. And so in these moments, I call your attention. Uh, I'm going to speak on something that I'm, I'm a verse-by-verse -verse guy. I'm not really comfortable with topical, but I'm going to do more of a topical presentation. And I'd like you to turn with me to John 17. John chapter 17. One of my favorite subjects in the Bible is the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle and the temple and then the leaving of that Shekinah glory and the, the, the God dwelling with his people in the Old Testament as a prefiguring of the Messiah being the God man who dwells among his people I don't see how any Jew can deny that God can dwell with his people and that their whole testament's about God dwelling with his people and then the Shekinah glory leaving in Ezekiel what a picture leaving from the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus, who was that Shekinah glory, according to John 12, Isaiah saw his glory, leaves from the Mount of Olives, and comes back to the Mount of Olives. That's, that's so exciting to me. See Christ in the Old Testament, and how it all fits together so beautifully and how very, very important it is. And that whole subject is exciting to me, but another subject that is very much connected with it, very, very much connected with it, uh, the Shekinah glory was the manifestation of God's presence and all his beauty and, and grandeur and greatness and holiness and love Remember, Moses said, show me your glory. He'd already seen the glory, and he wanted more. And we got more in the New Testament when Jesus was incarnate, as John chapter 1 so very clearly shows us in verse 14. But I want to start in John 17, and having said that in introduction, I want to ask ourselves a couple of questions in the two messages that I have. We know that the glory of God is the manifestation of the attributes of God and, uh, uh, and it, it's the presence of God being manifested. But what does it mean to glorify God? And what does it mean to be glorified by God? Understanding that the full manifestation of God's attributes is the glory of God, then Jesus is that. What does it mean to glorify God, who's glorious? What does it mean to be glorified by God? That's what I want to talk about today, taking the first one in the first message and the second one in the second. So mystery is now solved. And why is it vitally important to live our lives and do our ministries for the glory of God? What is our function? What is our role? 
as Christians, as churches? What's it all about? And read with me John 17, just the first five verses, if you would. This is the great high priestly prayer that all of you have known and all of you have heard, preached, and maybe taught it yourself. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. This is the night before he died and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you as you've given him power or authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I've glorified you on the earth. I finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So certainly our Lord brings in the manifestation of God's glory that was in eternity past, and also, I believe, in the tabernacle, and he is that, but he brings in these other things, too. And I just think it would be interesting for us to explore this subject together and see where it goes. We've all used the term, we've all read the verses in the Bible about glorified God. But all of us have also probably had the experience of misunderstanding or misinterpreting a word or a concept. We think we know it. And we use the terminology maybe for years and then we get a dictionary out and think, wait a minute, I've been using that word wrong. Maybe I was partially right, but there were there are facets to it I never understood. Now, if you haven't done that, that's okay, but I've, I've done it. And so certainly for this study, I got into Bible dictionaries and, and Hebrew concordances and uh, Greek concordances and studied out all the stuff about kabod and and doxa and all the verbs and all the rest of it. I'm not going to get into that today. I just want to look by way it's helpful. But I just want to look at this in a way that just will kind of move our hearts and stun us with our God, who He is and who we are and what we are to be about because of that. That's my goal. (coughs) J.C. Ryle, Bishop J.C. Ryle said of John 17, these verses begin one of the most wonderful chapters in the Bible. And John Knox asked his wife to read John 17 to him on his deathbed. And the old Puritan George Newton had a whole book on John 17 of sermons. And he said, truly, such a prayer made by such a one as Jesus Christ at such a time and on such an occasion and among such a company must needs be heavenly and ravishing and therefore deserves our best attention both in handling and hearing. He said that as only a Puritan could say it, right? They'd never say anything in five words if they could say it in 20. But in this particular chapter, if we just kind of want to get a handle on it, Jesus is praying about his upcoming death. And just to give you a little bit of an outline, because I can't help doing this, I'm I'm an outline guy. We see in these first five verses, and we know Jesus prays for himself, and then he prays for the apostles, and then he prays for the church. I think you all know that outline on this section. But in this first section alone, just these first five verses, we see the harmony of God, the harmony of God being displayed in the death of Christ. God the Father and God the Son are in total harmony. 
And when he says the hour has come, he's talking about his upcoming death. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify thee. They're in complete harmony. And uh, then we, we also see the generosity of the Godhead to each other. This is a very interesting thing. It says, and you've given him power over all flesh. God the Father gave that to God the Son. That's generosity. He has power over every human on this planet. Saved and unsaved. In fact, he has to have power over everyone so he can give eternal life to some of the at all. <laughs> That's the whole point. Jesus controls everything. Everything. Amen. He is power over all flesh. Isn't that encouraging when you think about people you know and you pray for and they're unsaved and they're hard and they're wayward? Isn't it encouraging that when you have enemies that are against you and want to do everything they can to stop your work? Our Lord has power over all flesh. All authority he's been given in heaven and earth, right? That's why he tells us to go to all nations. And so the generosity of the Godhead to each other, he says, you've given him, that's Jesus, authority over all flesh, that he, that's Jesus, should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. So the Father gives Jesus everybody. You, you run everything. And among those people that I give you, I'm going to give some of them to you as a love gift. You're my love gift to them, and they are my love gift to you. That you might give eternal life to as many of those as, as how's he put it, uh, that you might give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That's all election and sovereignty and all of that. So the harmony of the Godhead is displayed in the death of Christ. The generosity of the Godhead is displayed in uh, uh, their gifts to each other. And then the reality of the Godhead. The reality of the Godhead. Uh, he goes on and he says, he's talking about that. And... And this is life eternal, verse 3, that they might know you, the only true God. The only true God. Allah is not God and Muhammad is not his prophet. This is eternal life, that they might know you and the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. There is a true God. He's the ultimate reality in the universe. And that only true God sent Jesus. He sent no one else but him to be the savior of the world. And the reality of that true God can be known and his reality is known by some, even if it's not known by all. This is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom I've sent. I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. The reality of the true God can be known, and his reality is known by some, even if it's not known by all. And knowing that true God in Jesus Christ is eternal life. Eternal life is not just living forever. It's living. <laughs> we're not living if we don't know God. We're dead. This is the true God and Jesus Christ. This Knowing the true God in Jesus Christ is eternal life. That eternal life is a gift from Jesus Christ to those who receive it. He gives eternal life to those God the Father has given him. So we've seen the harmony of the Godhead, the generosity of the Godhead, the reality of the Godhead, and now we come to the glory of the Godhead. The glory of the Godhead. Not unto us, David said. Not unto us. But to you be the glory. The glory of the Godhead. Notice what he says in verse 5. And now, O Father, 
Glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That's something. These are deep verses. These are glorious verses. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said on this particular verse, even before he is concerned about saving us, he's concerned about revealing the glory of God. This is a very important point. Even, listen to me, listen to what Martin Lloyd-Jones says. Even before he's concerned about saving us, he's concerned about revealing the glory of God. I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work you gave me to do. Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And then he goes on, I manifest thy name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. Would you see? Would you say Jesus was um, theocentric or anthropocentric? Those are ten-dollar words, aren't they? Is he God-centered or man-centered? Here comes another one. If Jesus is theocentric rather than anthropocentric, shouldn't we, his bride, be theocentric? not anthropocentric oh we need to love men we need to reach men we need to minister to people but behind it all and above it all and beyond it all is God and his glory the glory of God is revealed in the salvation of men But the glory of God takes priority over the salvation of men. We don't compromise God's glory to reach people. Jesus is theocentric. Are we? Are we man-centered or God-centered? Just ask it. I need to ask myself that. I hope we love people. I hope we love them as Jesus loved them. I hope he loves them through us. I hope we want to get around people. We want to be with people. We want to give them the gospel. We want to minister to them in their misery and their suffering. What's the matter with us if we can't do that? But sometimes people's needs can just overwhelm us so much and occupy us so much, it's hard to think about other things. You know, sometimes when you're ministering to people... You're so caught up in them. It's so overwhelming. My wife and I have had nine people, maybe ten, world number ten. Only one of them outside of our family that we were involved in their last of life care. Not all of it, but some of it. That's in the last ten years. We've had about one a year. My mother-in-law lived with us for six months, six months, six years. (laughs) And she was unsaved. But thank the Lord she did get saved about six months before she died. We are not sorry we took her in. But sometimes when you're ministering to someone needy at the end of their life, it becomes all-consuming. And very distracting. You all know that. I I see mostly gray hair and (laughs) bald heads out there. We all know that, right? (coughs) I don't have COVID. I don't have the flu. I've got allergies. I had bronchitis, but it's gone. Just the cough is there. Now, as we look at this particular section, it's pretty obvious Jesus was committed to God's glory in every word and act. And Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 says he radiated God's glory. He just radiated God's glory. And 
that was very much a, a part of who he was ministering to lost ministering to the saved but radiating God's glory and Arthur Pink said having glorified God on earth it's fitting that the, that the saved should be glorified in heaven another said while it's entirely for the benefit of men namely for their redemption it involved a higher purpose the glorification of God all your ministries all my ministries should be for the glory of God and I, I, I'm saying that not as an assumption that can be assumed and not recognized I'm saying it as a presupposition and assumption in everything we do it's like the core value statements business businesses have this is non-negotiable now Jesus does not ask for a D incarnation here <laughs> he doesn't say I'm tired of being a man I've had 33 years of this I'm done I want to go back without my humanity I just want to I want to go back and be the third uh, the second person that God had and I'm done with this now I've, I've lived here 33 years I'm getting ready to die on the cross I just want to go back no no what he's doing and Hebrews is picturing this and so does John he's praying as the second person of the God uh, Godhead as the son of God incarnate who's going to take his humanity with him to heaven so the first human is now glorified permanently it's an amazing thought if we just think about it in Christ in Christ Jesus the word we exchange darkness for light as we think of God and he's talking about his work of revelation for 33 years he's now finished that He's talking about the work of redemption that's going to take six hours on the cross. I finished the work you gave me to do. I'm ready to go. Now, you and I will probably never finish the work God's given us to do in one sense, right? Because we are what we are. He's created us in Christ Jesus under good works that God's before ordained that we should walk in them. And we will, but sometimes we walk a little slow. But he certainly finished it. But there's a huge application here. One of the ways we glorify God is to finish the work that God's given us to do. I'm 74. I'm getting tired. I just admit that. I don't know how long God will have me as a pastor. And I would enjoy being retired. And if I retire, I still want to glorify God and I still want to minister but I don't know where the end time is it seems like the goal line just gets farther away every, every time I think I'm getting close it gets farther away but the point is what? to finish the work God's given us to do and our salvation itself is for the glory of God and our service is for the glory of God as Jesus's was John MacArthur said what stands in the way of glorifying God is us seeking glory from men don't want to do that we don't want to think we don't we don't want to make a name for ourselves that's not what we're here for that's Tower of Babel stuff you know we don't want that Someone said, I think it was the guy that was with the Moravians, uh, Count Zinzendorf, preach the gospel to everyone you can and die unknown. Die unknown. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about them. So much damage has been done because some preacher wants to make a name for himself. Or some church wants to make a name for themselves. Someone else said, prayer, prayer begins and ends not with the needs of men, but with the glory of God. It should be concerned primarily with those, 
with who God is and what he wants and how he is to be glorified. And Andrew Murray said, Each time before you intercede, be quiet first and worship God in His glory. Think of what He can do and how He delights to hear the prayers of His redeemed people. Think of your place and privilege in Christ and expect great things. We should expect great things, but we... What did the psalmist... What did did the, the, the partner of Jeremiah... God said, You're seeking great things for yourself? Seek them not. The ministry is the greatest thing going down here. It is the greatest. Every, the greatest thing you got is your ministry. Do it. You don't have to have a position to do it. I keep telling my church, you don't have to be a Sunday school teacher or have a position in the church to have a ministry. You're a Christian. you got a ministry. Just do it. <laughs> don't even have to ask my permission. Just do it. Now, if you do it in the church, you have to be appointed <laughs> but there's Bible classes there's Bible clubs there's witnessing to your neighbors there's all kinds of things you can do without a position we're living in times where God's glory is being ignored they didn't glorify him as God Romans 1 21 that's America and all of sin comes short of the glory of God but true Christians have that as a focus this is not even close to optional turn with me to Romans chapter 15 no chapter 16 did you ever peruse the doxologies in the Bible I'm sure everybody here this is a music church you know the difference between a benediction and a doxology I remember when I was young, I didn't know just words to me. I didn't know. But a benediction is where you call God's blessing down on you. A doxology is when you give praise up to God, right? And I know 99% of you people knew that, but I didn't as a young person. So there might be one person here that doesn't. All right, good. (laughs) So a benediction is like number six. You call God's blessings down. Uh, A doxology is where you give praise up. And so in Romans 16, 27, the book of Romans, that great book of Romans about our salvation and justification and sanctification and everything else, it ends with, as you would expect, to God, only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. And if that's not enough, go to 1 Corinthians 10. And I know you know this verse. I bet everybody here knows this one. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The Apostle Paul writes this verse, and I wish everybody would just mark this verse for themselves, for their church, for their ministries, for everything they do, because Paul says in 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We have no right to do anything for any other reason. But we get tempted, don't we? We want some glory. We want to be known as something or someone. And Satan exalted himself, didn't he? Jesus went the other way. He didn't think it a thing to be hung on to to be equal with God, but took on himself uh, no reputation, took the form of a man and all the rest of it. He just went down, 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 down. The Antichrist goes up, up, up <laughs> in his own estimation, proclaiming himself he's God. Jesus went the other direction. So our, our very salvation is not about ourselves as much as it's about him. God's glory is the, to be the ultimate thing of everything he does. It's to be the ultimate thing that all of us do. And it's not to be assumed and forgotten. It's, 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 it's to be a conscious end. It's to be factored in. Am I giving myself some glory here? Am I promoting myself? Am I promoting my church? Am I promoting my ministry? Am I, or am I promoting the Lord? What is the most important thing? Now, here is where it gets very interesting. 
Turn with me to Jude 25. Do you realize how easy it is to get um, detracted from this? I happen to love the book of Jude. It's one of my favorite books to teach. It's one of my favorite books to meditate upon. And Jude wanted to write about the common salvation. Good subject. Needful subject. We need to know about the common salvation. We need to exalt about all that. But then the false teachers came in and he changed his mind, right? I want to teach this, but I, now I'm going to teach this. There's something wrong with you if all you want to do is find fault with somebody else. There's something wrong with us if we're a heresy hunter, like a dog on the scent and we really can't, don't have any positive emphasis. We love the negative. We love to find somebody's wrong. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have discernment against false teachers. We have to have that. That's why, the, that's why Jude changed, right? And Jude was interested. He had a warning ministry. He, he knew he had to have a warning ministry. And he also reminded him of evangelism. Because he talked about the people uh, later on in the book of Jews, some have difference, making a difference, others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Jude was still concerned about common salvation. He was still concerned to getting other people saved no matter how bad off they were. He had all kinds of concerns. But he ends his book with a doxology, a book on warning, a book on all kinds, he's doing all kinds of things in this little book to minister to these folks. But he says in verse 25, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Was Jude God-focused? I think so. So being God-focused doesn't mean we never talk about anything else, or we never do anything else, but just sing. We're not even going to, I personally don't think we're, all we're going to do in heaven is sing. Now, I like to sing, although I'm not very good at it. And I'm glad when we sang that one hymn, the Irish one that I just love, after, I can't hit that one note all the time in the, in the, uh, at the end that you didn't sing. I love hitting it, but I can't do it anymore. I'd squeak all over the place. But it's important for us to love all these other things and be engaged in all these other things. But we, these good things, these important things, these essential things, evangelism's essential. But how many times has evangelism brought churches into compromise? Think of new evangelicalism. Make reaching people the main thing. So we'll hold hands with false teachers. Evangelism is the main thing. We've got to save people. Or uh, they make that a main focus. Great damage has been done by that. Unho- unbiblical alliances with the harlot church and all of that stuff. God keep us from that. Then we had the uh, seeker-friendly movement. Boy, everybody jumped on that bandwagon. Not me. I didn't jump on it. But many people jumped on it. That sounds good. But you know how Satan works in incrementalism? Seeker-friendly has become sin-friendly now. Now we got churches we would never imagine would be sin-friendly. They're not sinner-friendly. We should want sinners to come, don't we? We don't want to be holier now. We want every, if I could get any of these people and any of these sins in my church, I'd do it. But I don't want to become sin friendly where I condone things. And seeker friendly has become sin friendly in our woke age. I am anti woke. I hope you are. I trust you are. I don't get overoccupied with it. I have people that I preach to that I don't even mention it. I've got a guy in a nursing home that wears a dress and a wig. He calls me dad. (laughs) I don't know about that. 
He thinks he's saved. I just minister to him. We don't have to make a big deal out of stuff all the time, but we do have to have standards, right? About church membership, about who can serve, all that stuff. And so, may God help us. Uh, and Jude certainly maintained the glory of God's at stake. Unbiblical alliances uh, are not part of glorifying God. Look in Galatians where false teachers came in. Paul talks about the glory of God when he was fighting for the gospel in Galatians 1.5. And of course that last verse, God forbid that I should glory, 6.15 save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world's crucified to me in the world. I'm going to glory in the cross and it's going to cost me. And that's why the false teachers are seeking you so they won't be persecuted. They won't glory in the cross, but I am. The gospel of grace gives glory to God. So all of this is so important. The book of Hebrews, did I do Hebrews 13? I got off track. Did I do that already? Turn to Hebrews 13, 21. The book of Hebrews ends with a beautiful picture here in 21. Well, verse 20, Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd from the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Now what was the writer of Hebrews doing? He was encouraging these Jewish Christians to go outside the camp. Everything he was saying in the whole book was to get to that exhortation. You got you got thirteen. We got twelve chapters of cock and the pistol, and he fires it in chapter thirteen. Let's go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. We don't have to be big shots down here. We don't have to be well thought of of, of people that hate our Lord. I don't want people that look hate my Lord to think I'm something. Why would I want that? So it's possible to get so caught up in helping men get saved or men and women grow even. Oh, our church is about discipleship. Our church is about ministry to people. Good. That's good. In fact, that's great. That's not just good. That is great. But look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter, chapter 3. How did Peter end his epistle? Second Peter. One, on growing. He was big, Peter was big on growing. I, most churches aren't big on growing people. Most people aren't developing people. That's terrible. You can go to a church 30 years and know nothing. Peter was very big on seeing people grow. And he, he gives... Every chapter is a different reason why people need to grow. Grow in chapter 1 because of what God's already done to you. Grow in chapter 2 because of what the false teachers want to do to you. And grow in chapter 3 about what God's going to do for you. He's all about growing. He's ready to die. He wants the people to grow. But that's not where he stops. But grow in grace, verse 18, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Oh, the last thing he said was grow. Uh, Almost. Almost the last thing. You see how careful the apostle is? Very careful. He didn't stop with getting people to grow. He stopped with what? To him be glory both now, forever, and ever. God-centered churches. God-centered ministries. Passionate about helping men, reaching men, women, boys and girls. Passionate about them because we're passionate about God. And never let the one who was past the other. Remember that man in Acts chapter 12 verse 23 didn't give God the glory? You know what happened to him. 
okay, we won't focus on ecumenical evangelism or or anything like that. We 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 just want to focus on growing, discipling. Well, we that the last word is, is give God the glory. It's the ultimate. And we want to be conscious about evangelism, conscious about discipleship. We want to do the one another's. We want to but the vertical is always the key to the horizontal. Isn't that true about biblical counseling? Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. The vertical is always key to the horizontal. But the vertical, if the vertical doesn't exist, the horizontal won't be effective. And the horizontal exists because the vertical exists. You've got to have that. If you don't have that, you can't do what you're trying to do to help people. What's the very first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism? First question. Written 300 years before I was born. 302 years before I was born. And remember, catechism is, they they write down the question and they give the answer. And the children or the young Christians are supposed to understand the question and then get the answer. First question, what is the chief end of man? I think they had that right. The man's chief end answer is to glorify God and join forever. What's the second question? Everybody knows the first question. What's the second question? What rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? Oh, I know the first question. Well, here's the rule. The second question is, what rule has God given to direct us how we may enjoy Him? And the answer is, the Word of God, which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. I don't think Andy Stanley read that is the only rule to direct how we may glorify and enjoy Him. And and then he goes, I'm going to ask you one more. What's the last question? There's 107. What's question 107? It deals with the Lord's Prayer. What does the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer teach us? Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It teaches us to take our encouragement in prayer for God, from God only and our prayers to praise Him and glorify Him in, in testimony of our desire uh, and, 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 and so forth. So it begins and ends with that. The chief end of man is not men or women or children or anything. The chief end of man is not ourselves. The chief end of man is to glorify God. He's the end in all we do. That's the biblical priority that Jesus begins his prayer with. And so it should be that with which we minister through. Let's get our minds and hearts out of first gear. (laughs) And let's let the Bible direct our thoughts. And whatever we do, may we do for the glory of God. We have to have priorities. We have to have priorities. We have to have biblical priorities. My time's almost up, so I'm not going to do... I don't want you to turn to Ezra 3, but Ezra had priorities. If you read Ezra chapter 3, they had the proper people, Ezra 1 and 2, but they had the proper priorities, Ezra 3. I'll just quote these without... Don't turn to them in your Bible, just in your mind. Priority number one, the temple was to be rebuilt before the city was rebuilt. That's called a priority. They had no walls, they had no protection. Temple was rebuilt before the city was rebuilt. Priority number two, uh, the altar was built before the temple was built. (laughs) Rebuilt. You see, they had priorities. Uh, All that's kind of important. Priority number three, uh, Priority number three was the right kind of altar was built, not just any kind of altar. Priority number four, the altar was utilized and uh, uh, was utilized. They didn't just build it and look at it. They used it before they even had a temple. 
Priority number five, worship trumped, and I'm not talking the presidential candidate, worship trumped both temple completion, both temple completion and everything else. And they were sacrificial as they could be, scriptural as they could be, they were careful as they could be, and they were enthusiastic as they could be, and they laid the foundation. And some people cried, the old guys cried, it's not as big as the old one. But worship trumped nostalgia. <laughs> Don't get stuck where you are, thinking it's, the old days are better now. Number six, sixth priority, it's not about us or our comfort or our desires. We must be willing to have a diminished life if it will help the work of God go forward. Those people left the comforts of where they were to live in a very dangerous place, in a very difficult place. And they didn't have the big temple. They just had a little altar. And they, then they got a little temple. They lived a diminished life. You know, you can live a diminished life in this world if you are sure about the next one. I may not get all that I want here. I've got a list of both hands of places I'd like to go before I die. I don't think I'm going to get through one more of the hands, probably. If I don't make it, it's okay. And I don't want that to take away my serving the Lord. It's not about us, our comfort, or our desires. It must be willing to have a diminished life if the work of God can go forward. Seven, it's not enough to begin with proper priorities. They must be maintained through trial and opposition. And boy, Ezra and Nehemiah, they got attacked, didn't they? All right, I'm, I'm done except for an illustration. I'm sorry, I'm taking away your meal time. You just have to eat faster. <laughs> I know Disneyland went woke, and I know there's bad things said about Walt Disney. I'm not trying to justify him and everything. It's just an illustration. Apparently in his early days, Walt Disney, back in the 1920s, before he was rich or famous or known, they were just getting started. He had different people working for him. He would drive some people home because he had a car and they didn't, but he just had an old car. He couldn't even afford a new suit. He had an old suit and an old car. And he met this gal that he was driving home with some other people and he kind of liked her and he wanted to meet her family, but he didn't want to meet him in his old suit. So he went to his brother and got an advance of 40 bucks to buy a suit. I wish I could buy a suit for 40 bucks. So it was the spring of 1925, and finally this gal and him got interested in each other. Her name was Lily. And then finally Walt Disney came and popped the question, and this is how he did it. I thought it was interesting. He said, Lily, this old car has seen better days. What do you think I should buy next, a new car or an engagement ring? <laughs> That's a creative <laughs> way to propose, right? In other words, you want me to just keep driving you around or do you want to get married? She said, a ring. <laughs> uh, very, but it's pretty obvious where her pri his priorities were and her priorities were, right? Is it obvious where my priorities are? your priorities it's very obvious where Jesus' priorities were I'll go to the cross glorify your son that your son might glorify you Father thank you for what we looked at today with the Apostle Paul we say may Christ be magnified whether by my life 